Hello there and welcome to another lockdown story time and today it's Friday the 20th of March 2020. I'm happy to kind of look down here and it actually says Thursday the 19th but that was yesterday's and today is today another day and it's a sad day here in the UK for all the kids and the teachers um, because uh, all the schools are closing down today and it's four o'clock so everyone uh, will have left except some uh, some of the, the kids of the um, sort of key workers are going to be still allowed to go to school but it's going to be a very different kind of thing and I feel really sorry for all you year sixes uh, here in the UK year six is uh, they're kind of 11 year olds who would be leaving primary school which is elementary school in the states and will be moving up uh, to big school uh, uh, which could mean all sorts of different kinds of school and um and and usually what happens at the end of term there's a great big kind of party and you know and uh, disco and and everybody has a great big thing and they swap t-shirts and write their names on each other and they all cry and say goodbye and probably haven't had time to do that and i don't think he'll be going back to school uh this year and have be able to have that kind of leavers day so uh I, i'm sorry for you you're going to miss that and this is going to be an interesting generation, I think, as you grow up, you'll be able to say I was a Corona kid and uh, affected, affected by by that. And so there's, there's, there's the year sixes and the I'm not quite sure how it works in is it 11s who will be doing G, should be doing GCSEs and the year um, 13s who do A levels. I don't really visit um, secondary schools so I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the years in secondary schools but uh, there's a whole lot of worry about how exams are going to get dealt with and stuff like that but it'll all get solved it'll all get sorted out and we'll all get back to normal one day but it's going to be a long summer I went uh, to the garden centre this morning I thought I bet I would thought maybe people are thinking about digging for victory and I'm thinking I'm going to make a slightly bigger vegetable patch this summer. I thought I better get some seeds. And so I went down, I got myself some tomatoes and grow bags and and it was busy. And I said, is everyone digging for victory? And the lady said, oh, yes, it's been very, very busy. And uh, and yesterday, I can't remember if I said I, I went down to the local um, supermarket and um i met a friend of mine there who's one of the managers and and uh i said oh is it busy she said oh it's been crazy she said it's been, <laughs> they've taken more money than they have at christmas week and i know another friend of ours works at a at a, a supermarket and they said it's been just like christmas but without all the jingle bells and the music and the decorations so <sighs> i think everybody's just trying to get what they can but i think it's going to be all right i think it'll you know it's not quite the war yet and you know food supplies will still keep coming along anyway let's not let's not get worried about that <laughs> so um i keep thinking people will be watching this in 100 years time and thinking what what um even in five years time we'll be looking back oh yeah i remember that anyway today what am i going to tell you about today? i'm going to tell you about craig manure no no first of all i'm going to tell you that i have had my first drawing yesterday i read to you uh, viking vic you may remember and i have had now if i get the right one here we are look uh ogre grinstaff hi dave <laughs> um has uh, posted this, and this is their version of Viking Vic, because I showed you how to draw Viking Vic. And uh, and I love this. He's on a skateboard. And uh, David tells me there is a kind of um, skateboard wheel that is called Bones. Do you get it? Do you get it? And what I really love is the prow of the skateboard is like a kind of a Viking ship. So that's great fun. And he's got the swirly whirly dragon belt too, which I didn't really do in my in my thing. So that was well observed. That's fantastic. And you could have your drawing on there as well. <laughs> so if you do one of my drawings, uh, let's say also from from my draw stuff real easy um, videos. If you you don't know about draw stuff real easy, go to the draw stuff real easy channel on YouTube. I've got hundreds of drawings on there, which are kind of easy ones. And on this channel, the draw stuff. 
uh, Shoe Render Drawing Channel, I got hundreds and hundreds of videos as well. So if you do kind of one of my drawing tutorials, then post it up um, on Twitter or Instagram and uh, hashtag it with Shoe B Doodle. There's two E's in B, <laughs> Shoe B Doodle. And uh, then I'll be able to find it. And I could be showing your picture here tomorrow. Not tomorrow, it's Friday. So I'll be back on Monday. And I have been thinking it's a bit boring having me here all on my own all the time. So I've been getting in touch with some of my author friends and saying, would they like to come on as a guest? And one or two have said yes. So uh, next week I'm planning on having some guests along, which will make it even more exciting <laughs> on lockdown. Down story time. I should have a kind of an echo thing. Go, Lockdown story time. So anyway, today I'm going to read you the story Craig Manure, which came about when um, years ago uh, there was this fantastic thing called the, the, the Scottish Book Bus. And it was a great big mobile library and we were going trundling around Scotland and I, I went to islands and highlands and everything. It was fantastic uh, with a bunch of great drivers and, and we just had a really good time. And uh, it was hard work, mind you. And uh, I was with Colin, Colin McBookbus. And we were going across to the Isle of Mull and we were on the uh, on the ferry. I'm not very good at on ships. And anyway, we were coming into the port, which is called Craig Muir. And I'm a bit dyslexic and I misread it as Craig Muir. So the whole time we were on the Isle of Mull, um, I kept on going on about sort of developing this character called Craig Muir, who lives on an island in the middle of the Atlantic. And, uh, and he kind of... He earns his living scraping bird poo off the rocks and selling it for fertiliser. And when I got home, I kind of <laughs> went to some publishers and said, what do you think of this idea? And they were horrified. They thought it was a terrible an idea. So what I did was I made a website. I made a Craig Manure website. I'll show you it at the end. And, uh, and from that came a kind of an idea for a story. And then uh, Barrington Stoke who write books specifically, who publish books for people with dyslexic kind of reading. And so they take great care that, the, the, you know, you can see the paper is kind of slightly uh, off white and, um, and they, they, they really take care over the production so that they're kind of easy to read. And they said, would I write a story? And um, <laughs> Barrington Stoke are based in Edinburgh. And I said, well, I've got this story. It's kind of a Scottishy story. And they went, oh, that's perfect. So, so I found a publisher who actually liked it. And I'm going to just read this um, because, well, no, I should, I should probably do it under the camera so then you can see the pictures at least. But um, anyway, let's, I'm going to change cameras. So here we are. Is that under the camera? It is, oh, I better put my glasses on too. <clears throat> so this is Craig Manure. Chapter, I'm, I'm going to do this in a, oh, is the microphone working? I'm, I'm going to do this in a terrible Scottish accent. I need a slurp of tea. So, uh, all my Scottish friends, I apologise. <laughs> it's going to swing from Morningside to Glasgow and then a little bit of Highlands and possibly a bit of, bit of, of Orkney and Shetland too. So, um, yeah, I have a kind of slightly mixed up. Um, thing. In fact, uh, on the website once, I had somebody contacted me from Tierra del Fuego, saying how wonderful it was to hear a voice from from the old country. And I had, I thought, I I better not tell them the truth. So anyway, here we go. Chapter one: Guys from the sky. Well, I bet you saw that TV program about me and my island, and I bet you laughed like everyone else. Well, I can tell you that what they said was all lies. I am now writing this book so you will know what it's really like. Uh, Craig Manure's my name and Manure's my game, as it says on the side of my tractor. I'm not ashamed to say that I make my living out of bird poo. In fact, I'm proud of what I do. I even managed to get the publishers to print this book on paper that's the same colour as puffin poo. Let me start my story from the beginning. I live on a tiny island called Bronx Cheer in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and I scrape bird poo off the rocks. I put the poo into bags and I send it to my cousin in Scotland who turns it into Big Jobby, the world's finest garden manure. 
Now, I'm just doing what my father did before me and his father did before him. And once you've tasted a potato that's been grown in Big Jobby, you'll understand what I do is not just a job, it's a vocation. It's my mission in life, and I feel proud to have been chosen. Not an awful lot happens on my island, and sometimes we get visitors who come to study the amazing wildlife, and they're usually outdoor types who bring tents and look after themselves. Uh, uh, by the way, when I say we, I mean myself and my wee dog, Angus. I wouldn't want you to think I was a lonely old fool who talked to himself. Now, once in a while, something strange will happen on the island. Uh, I know it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's nearly on the way to somewhere, so you can never be sure what will appear over the horizon. One day, from out of the sky, a helicopter appeared and landed in my yard. If there's one thing this island is famous for, it's wind. But the blast from the blades of that helicopter nearly blew the house down. And these big guys got out. But they were wearing bright orange suits and helmets like they were aliens or something. And Angus went barking mad. I should have a thingy going bark, bark, bark. <laughs> Sound effect. Uh, the guys were from the phone company. The island has been used as a halfway staging post for the phone cable to the USA. Uh, this cable was laid across the Atlantic Ocean in 1952. We've had free phone calls ever since, but I sometimes worry that they might bring me a phone bill one day. It turned out they wanted to lay a new cable across the ocean, a modern fibre optic one. The information superhighway was coming right past my front door. The internet was coming to Bronx Cheer. The fibre optic signal couldn't get across the ocean in one go, so they wanted to build a booster station on the island. It would take them a few months to do all the work, so they asked if they could build a hut that they could live in for a while. Soon, an even bigger helicopter arrived with the hut hanging underneath it. In several parts, uh, this was no garden shed. When it was put together, it was massive. When all the work was finished and the cable had been laid, the men went home and the hut was left behind with the booster station in it. And they said, I could use the rest of the hut if I looked after the booster station for them. The booster station was just a box that stood in the corner of one room. It didn't do much except flashlights on and off. But, and here's the best bit. It was connected to a computer with the fastest internet connection in the whole world, and I could use it for free. Now, I've never been afraid of high-tech stuff, and I love playing with big boys' toys, so it didn't take me long to get grips, to grips with the internet, and everything you need is there. If you don't know how to do something, there's a website to explain it to you, or you can email. People on the internet are very helpful. HTML world that dates it, doesn't it? <laughs> Chapter 2, Website Madness. Well, the winters are terribly cold and bleak on the island. Sometimes the wind blows so hard you can't stand up. The winter nights are long and dark. I was snowed up in my house for the most of January. The poor Angus couldn't even get out for a pee, so I had plenty of time to build my Craig Manure website. The day my website went live on the internet, it was a wee bit of a letdown. I thought something would happen right away, but nothing did. I'd hoped the whole world would want to have a look at it. Uh, they didn't. But the next day, I had my first email. It was from a Scotsman who lives in South America. He said my website made him feel like he was back at home, and that's true. <laughs> then I had an email from a friend of his, and then I got emails from friends of his friends, and before long, I was getting more emails than I could answer from people all around the world. 
Now, there is one website that tells you who has the most visited website on the internet, and mine was soon amongst the most popular, and newspapers began to write about me. It wasn't long before I got an email from a TV station in London. They wanted to make a TV programme about me. They said there'd been lots of programmes about people who'd been left on islands to see how they survived. And now they wanted to make a film. Uh, it's a movie to you Americans. About me. <laughs> about me. A real life island survivor. All I had to do was carry on doing what I did normally every day. And they would film me. Uh, they seem to be really interested in my work. Well, like I said before, I'm really proud of my work and I thought a TV programme would be a chance to share my passion for poo with a wider world. Also, it sounded like a bit of fun and they were paying me good money too. They asked where they could stay on the island and well, I thought about the phone company's hut. It had bunk beds and a shower. Well, that's like four-star heaven round here. I'd already had the idea of renting the hut to visitors, so I told them mm, they could stay at the hotel. They were going to pay me good money for that too. So when spring came, I began getting ready for the TV crew's arrival. I painted a sign that said hotel above the door that led to the bunk room and over the middle door of the hut where the phone company men had cooked and eaten their meals I painted another sign that said dining room. Should be a restaurant, really. <laughs> Over the door to the booster station room, I painted another sign that said Cyber Cafe. I made a kind of sofa out of old wooden boxes I found on the beach, and I rigged up a windmill on the roof that gave enough power to work the kettle. It took an hour to boil the water, but I didn't want them to think I was still stuck in the 20th century. Well, the big day arrived, and my wee dog Angus and I stood on the headland, staring out to sea. A tiny dot appeared on the horizon. It was my cousin Dougie bringing the TV crew to the island in his boat. There were two of them. They were clearly not sailors, and when they arrived at the jetty, their faces were the colour of Puffin Poo. I thought that it was probably normal for people who live in London and never got any fresh air to look like that. Well, you do hear such stories about the place. But Dougie told me they'd started off quite fit and healthy, but had been throwing up over the side of the boat ever since they left the mainland. Angus took an instant dislike to them. He stood at the water's edge and growled at them. I should have a growl. <laughs> but, but all by the look on his face I knew he'd bite their ankles if he could. Dougie and I helped the two of them off the boat and laid them down on some sacks. In my trailer, and they groaned like a couple of stranded whales. And that's just what they look like too. Well, I drove the tractor carefully up to the hotel and they wailed and grunted every time I went over a wee bit of a bump. I showed them their rooms and when I offered them some peppermint tea, they, they turned a sort of green colour and buried themselves beneath the covers. Strange people. Peppermint tea sorts out my guts as fast as lightning. Dougie and I unloaded their cases and all the stores I'd asked him to bring. They must have been really ill. We didn't see them again till the next day. Dougie and I knocked on the hotel door to see if they were ready for breakfast. Oh, up in the camera a bit. Good morning, I said. This is a good morning, I said. I've got some nice fresh fried herrings and I've got seaweed bread. Or I can see if the hens have laid some eggs today. Oh, I could go and milk one of the coos if you just like breakfast cereal. They turned that weird puffin poo colour again. Maybe a wee bit of porridge then, I suggested. They managed to eat some porridge, but they complained about it being salty. They said they like sugar on their porridge. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Well, while we ate, Dougie 
told him that the tide was coming up fast and it was time for him to go back to the mainland. If they wanted to go with him, this was their last chance to leave the island until he returned for them in a week. They smiled a lot and said, Oh, thank you, but... No, I'd have to do a London accent. They smiled a lot and said, oh, Thank you, but uh, we, we've come to do a job and we'll finish what we started. Uh, they stayed. Chapter 3. The Gloop. Now, their names were Alice and Simon. When they finally came out of the hotel the next morning, they were looking a lot better. It was a beautiful summer's day, and they were wrapped up in bright red padded jackets like it was winter. It, is it always this cold? Simon asked. I looked around me. The, the sun was shining. A warm, gentle breeze was blowing from the south. Cold, I replied. This is a heat wave. They'd found the shower room, but they said they couldn't find the bathroom. It took a little while before I understood what they meant. And then I laughed. Oh, you mean the lavvy? Uh, then I had to explain about the toilets on the island. Well, you see that the island is solid rock, so we can't have any drains here. I have an earth closet in my place. It's just a hole in the ground, but I think you'd rather go to the public lavvy. It's up at the gloop. Just follow the path and mind the coos. Um... What's the gloop, Craig? Simon asked. Simon, I'm in a hurry, interrupted Alice. T tell it to the camera later. I watched them pick their way along the path. Simon trod in something and slipped. I swore loudly. Oh, oh and watch out for the coo-poo, I yelled. When they returned, they had weird smiles fixed on their faces. Alice got a camera out while Simon explained how we were going to film the programme. Now, what we want is to show your daily life here just as it is. We find it's best if you pretend that we aren't here. Just do what you normally do and we'll follow you around. And if I ask you a question, don't talk to me. Talk to the camera as if it's your best friend. A little red light twinkled on Alice's camera and the filming began. Action! she called. Simon smiled through gritted teeth. Uh, Craig? he asked. Um, would you mind talking to the camera and telling us what a coup is and what exactly is a gloop? Well, that was easy. I'll just have a slap of tea first. <laughs> Oh. Well, a coo is an island cow, I said. I've a herd of 20 that live mostly on the beach. Their favourite food is seaweed, which makes their poo amazingly rich and brilliant for garden manure. I put the coo pats into bags and I'll dry them out and on really cool days I'll burn them on the fire. And once they get crackling, my wee house is soon nice and warm and toasty. And the gloop is the natural wonder of the island. I went on to tell them, it's a tunnel that drops down into the roof of a cave. It can be found on top of the western cliffs. At the bottom of the cliff, on the seashore, is a large deep cave. And at high tide, when the sea is rough and the wind is in the west, the waves blast through this cave and shoot up out of the gloop like a rocket. It's over the gloop's hole that I built the public lavvy. It's quite a drop down into the cave, but it's all right if you've got something to read and you don't look down. The tide washes the cave out twice a day, so it's very clean. In fact, it beats the drains on the mainland any day, but you'll need to watch out and stand clear when the wind is blowing hard from the west. Chapter 4 Lights, Camera, Action Simon and Alice were not happy. I wasn't happy either. They followed me around all day like a pair of stupid puppies. They didn't know anything. They asked stupid questions all the time. If they weren't asking stupid questions, they were complaining about something or other. They complained, I didn't have fluffy white bread. 
I've always made my own wholemeal bread. It helps keeps my insides in order. And I complained there wasn't any soft toilet paper. What's toilet paper? They couldn't sleep because the sun hardly went down and they couldn't stand the smell of bird poo, so they wore scarves across their noses. What smell of bird poo? I can't smell anything. And if they weren't complaining, uh, they were saying nothing at all, just hiding behind that twinkling red light on the camera. They were filming all the time. They turned their backs to me and they'd huddle together to plot. They said they were planning what to film next, but I knew they were plotting against me. They were stuck on my island <laughs> until Dougie returned and there was no way off. So I just went about my daily business and they followed me and filmed me with the camera. Chapter 5, The B-52s Now every year millions of birds come back to the island to lay their eggs and each pair returns to the same old nest and for the last ten years the same pair of herring gulls have nested on the roof of my house. I call them the B-52s after the American Air Force bomber. Now, every year the B-52s come back to nest just above my front door and every day Mr B-52 waits for me to come out of the house so that he can poo on my head. Oh no! And Mrs B-52, she sits on the nest and cackles. <laughs> Very funny it is not. Well, glory be, this year the B-52s felt like a bit of a change and they decided that Simon and Alice were far more interesting targets to aim at. The B-52s moved their nest to the hotel roof and I had a poo-free year. Whenever Simon and Alice poked their heads out of the hotel, old Mr. B-52 was waiting for them. Brrr, splat! He was a master bomber, and he never missed. I had an idea that it was probably their fancy red padded jackets that had caught his eye. <laughs> Duck down, I exclaimed. Simon fell to his knees and covered his head with his clipboard. I laughed. No, not duck down like that. It's it's the duck down in your padded jackets that annoys them. Mr B-52 must think you're a rival birdie after his nest. Simon and Alice had to choose either to wear the jackets all covered in poo or to freeze. I still couldn't believe they were cold. After all, we were having a heat wave. Now, as I said at the beginning, manure's my name and manure's my game. I hadn't realised quite how much of my life was involved with poo until I had to spend each day talking about it to the camera. During the long summer days, while the birds are fixing up their nests and feeding their young, there's a lot of poo to be scraped up. There's a game I like to play while I collect up the coo poo. I call it tossing the coo poo. I choose a place to pile them up and mark it with a stick. And then I throw the coo poos at the target. And when they're really dry, they fly like frisbees. I reckon I'd get a gold medal if they had it in the Olympics. Angus tries to ca try and catch them as they fly through the air. Oh, that's so sweet, he yelled Alice. Do you think you could throw one in this direction so I can film Angus catching it? Well, uh, I chose a really chunky one that Angus would find easy to grab hold of and I tossed it <laughs> towards where Alice was filming. Angus, I called catch it, boy! As Angus leapt in the air, a gust of wind whoosh, lifted it out of his jaws and whisked it splat in the middle of Alice's face. It was crispy on the top, but still quite soggy underneath. It didn't hurt, but Alice swore that I'd aimed it at her. I'm good, but I'm not that good. Oh, I've not told you about the sheepies. Sheepies are special to the island too. You'll not find them anywhere else, but they're not really much use. But their poo 
does feed the loofah grass on the island and that's why it keeps it looking so nice and green. I tried to explain that you shouldn't stand behind them. Why? why what's the matter? Simon asked. Do, do sheepies kick? Well, we were standing in the middle of a flock of them. Uh, no, they don't kick, I said, but when sheepies poo, they shoot tiny little pellets out with such force they can hit a target 30 metres away. Be careful or they'll knock your hat off. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw one of their tails lift up. I yelled out, Simon Duck! Oh, where? Simon said. The fool was looking in the sky for ducks. It was too late. He was knocked to the ground by rapid machine gun fire. Do, 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 His nice red jacket was covered in black spots where he'd been hit. He looked like a giant ladybird. Those stains will never come out. I think I can safely say that Simon and Alice came into contact with most of the exotic bird life on the island. It's the peewee. It's, it's a bird that got its name because it likes to wee on your head. Alice used up all her shampoo and still couldn't get rid of the smell. Then there's a kind of gull that only lives on Bronx Cheer. It, it pukes up food for its young. It also spits a jet of vomit at anyone who comes too close. It's revolting stuff that can strip paint off a door. It took the lovely shiny silver finish off Alice's camera. Chapter 6. Curry Surprise. We're getting near the end, honestly. <laughs> Once or twice we nearly had a punch-up and it was clear that Simon and Alice blamed me for everything that had happened to them. But they managed to survive until Dougie came back. All week they'd been complaining about the food I cooked for them. The day before they left, I overheard Simon telling Alice he couldn't wait to get back to London so he could go for a slap-up curry. Oh, you like curry, do you? I asked. I can cook curry. Seeing as it's your last night on the island, we can make a bit of a party of it to show there are no hard feelings. I didn't want them to go home in a bad mood with me. I spent the whole afternoon working like a slave to prepare a huge steaming pile of curry. It was my own special recipe. There's nothing quite like it to clear out your inner tubes. This is great, Simon exclaimed. You should open a restaurant in London and sell this stuff. What's in it? Seeing how sensitive they were about their food, I thought it would be better if they didn't know about the island's special treat. Sea slugs are very tasty, but they don't look too pretty until they're cooked and then they look a bit like chicken. Oh, it's, it's the best seafood the island has to offer, I said and smiled sweetly. They seemed to be really grateful that I'd made such an effort and soon we were laughing and joking about the ups and downs of their week-long stay. Although I say it myself, it was an excellent curry and Simon had two helpings. I left them early so they could get a good night's sleep before the journey home the next day. <laughs> My Scottish accent's getting worse. Isn't it? <laughs> As I left the hotel, I looked up at the sky and I saw dark clouds. I licked a finger and I held it in the air to get a feel for the bad weather that I knew was moving in. <laughs> Oh, there's a fair old gale brewing up from the west, I called out to them as I closed the door behind me. It was a humdinger of a storm, and Angus, as usual, slept through it. Then, right in the middle of the storm, as the lightning flashed and sheets of rain lashed against the windows, Angus raised his head and growled. <laughs> I know all his little growls, and this one meant that Simon was out and about. I looked through the window, and I saw the beam of Simon's torch sway to and fro as he battled his way to the gloop. Now, this was not the night to need the lavvy. 
I put my waterproofs on and I battled my way to the gloop. It was the worst storm the island had seen since 1972. I tried calling out to Simon, but my voice flew away on the wind. I fought my way to the levee, but I was too late. Simon was already inside. And with the wind howling all around me, he could st I could still hear him groaning. He must have eaten too much curry. I told you it cleared out the inner tubes. I peered out to sea. The rain was battering my face, and then suddenly a monstrous wave loomed out of the darkness. It was heading for the cliffs and the cave down below. I banged on the door and shouted at the top of my voice, Simon, you've got to get out now! <coughs> was the only reply. The wave crashed into the cliff, filling the cave with water. There was only one way for it to go. I heard the water rush up the tunnel as it looked for a way out, and with an almighty galoop, a fountain of water blasted out of the roof of the lavvy, and surfing on the top of it with his trousers round his ankles was Simon. I've never seen anyone look so surprised. Chapter 7. Fame at last. Simon and Alice didn't come to breakfast the next day. They took all their things down to the jitty and waited for Dougie to come and get them. They didn't even say goodbye. I could have told them there was a very high tide expected that day. I couldn't be bothered. I'd had enough of them too. Angus and I watched as the water surged over the jetty and swept away their fancy cases. Luckily the tide was coming in, so the cases were washed ashore in the seaweed beds. Simon got very wet rescuing them. He slipped on something and fell headfirst into a rock pool. Oh, that'll be a sea slug, I told Angus. They're very slippery if you tread on them. At last... Dougie's boat arrived to take them home. Simon and Alice couldn't get the things on board fast enough. As the engine started up, I heard Simon's voice drift across the waves. We're free! We're safe! We're going home at last! But he had not reckoned on the B-52s. With the sun behind them, the gulls swooped down on a final bombing run to leave Simon and Alice a present to remember them by. <sniffs> the sea air turned blue with Simon's curses. They took a lot of film back to London with them. And that's where they had their revenge on me. We never used to get the TV out here, but now the satellite I get to see everything. They made a right fool out of me. The programme showed me happily at my work, talking about Pula. It was my whole life. I sounded like a babbling idiot. I can't help it. If you work with something every day, you get to be an expert. But they made it look like I was obsessed with poo. Even though I've got lots of other interests, like wind power, for example, and that's where all my electricity comes from. I'd hoped that people would see the programme who want to come to stay at my hotel. But when I saw the programme Simon and Alice had made, it looked as if it was just an old hut. No one would want to come and stay on the island the way they showed it, I thought. Well, I got so angry, I sat right down and wrote this book to get my side of the story straight. I got it all off my chest and then I felt a whole lot better. An awful lot of people watched that programme and after it was shown on TV, my website became the most popular in the world and I got into the record books. So many people wanted to come and visit the island and stay at the hotel after they saw the film and visited my website. The hotel is booked up for the next three years. I put my own website in there. Such interesting people I want to come and stay, like gas engineers and manure salesmen, compost experts and others who come in search of the simple life and good fresh island cooking. They all love my curry. 
and they all go away with special hats to remind them of the island. The hats have I survived the B-52s printed on them with little bits of bad poo. And so the island of Bronx cheer is now famous. It just goes to show the old saying is true. It's an ill wind that brings no one any good. And here we have there's tins of Bronx cheer curry, yum yum, sugar free, shooby poos. <laughs> <laughs> an island goo to remember the island by and a little model of a B-52. So there we are. And that tells you more about Barrington Stoke and stuff like that. So where... Let me go back to this camera. That, that's, that's a long story. <laughs> Dear old Craig Manure. Now, as I said, yes, <laughs> there is a Craig Manure website. If you look in the description box down below, there is a link. Now, I have to tell you... That <laughs> I made this website in the late 1990s. So it's about 20 years old. And it's an old Flash website. And your browser will probably say, ooh, 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 Flash website. And you'll have to probably give special permission if you really want to have a look at it. Uh, There's a body in the sky and he's got his beady eye on me. Yes, me. He's got nothing else to do but drop his number twos on me. Yes, me. Why, oh, why does the birdie in the sky always wait until I can walk him by? There's a birdie in the sky and he's got his little eye on me. Oh, me. Oh, no. come back in. so um uh, yeah there we go so that's kind of coming to the end of the session so 
I forgot to do some jokes yesterday. So this is the Ready Teddy Go joke book. Um, I did lots of joke books many years ago. So basically on story time here, I'm going through all my old books. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so here we have um, what elves have for their tea. Fairy cakes. Uh, what do you call a train full of sweets? A choo-choo train. Chew, no chewing. Uh, what do you call a rich rabbit? A million hair. You've got such a sweet face. It's just like a humbug. That's not very funny. What do drivers have in their sandwiches? Traffic jam. Is that smoked salmon? Not yet it isn't. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. There must be one good one in here somewhere. Uh, what do you call a cow eating grass? A lawn mower. It's getting better, isn't it? What do you get if you cross a cow with a camel? This is better. Lumpy milkshakes. <laughs> I'm supposed to get I'm supposed to get a sound effect there. Love will you get lumpy milkshakes? <laughs> there we go. That's uh, why do cows have bells? Because the horns don't work. <whistles> what happens if you walk under a cow? You get a little pat on the head. Where do milkshakes come from? Nervous cows. <laughs> Finally, what game do cows like to play at birthday parties? Musical chairs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think two uh, two pages of jokes is quite enough. So there we go. Well, thank you very much for watching. And as I said, I haven't, I haven't drawn Craig, but I, I think it's probably not time now. But um, if you want to uh, do a drawing from Draw Stuff Real Easy or from one of my She Ran a Drawing channel videos this channel you're watching now click down here and subscribe make sure you're subscribed to this channel for more and ring the bell when you can uh, and then you'll get notifications of when new videos are coming up and um that's friday i'm gonna go and have a nice cup of tea and for everyone who's just finished school you know well there you go that includes the teachers so you know you've got a long time ahead of you we've all got a long time lockdown ahead of us and I'll be here on Monday. And certainly I'm, I'm sort of writing on Tuesday. I will have a guest with me and I'll have a little think about what I'm going to read to you on Monday. And that means it's the weekend. TGFI in lockdowns. <laughs> Thank goodness it's Friday and we're all just going to sit around and watch the TV. We're going to watch the news about coronavirus. This is sad, isn't it? It's just very, very sad. Um, Anyway, I'll be here on Monday again, four o'clock UK time. I look forward to seeing you again. Have a good weekend. Well, thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed that, then please do make sure you are subscribed to the Shoe Rainer Drawing channel. And while you're about it, click the little bell next to the subscribe button and you will be notified when the next live drawing video will be. In the meantime, keep drawing, 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 practice, practice, practice. I'll see you next time. You take care now. Bye-bye.